Hi, I'm Pastor Roger Brown. God has gifted me the pleasure to pastor a dynamic, spirit-filled church called Life Changers Church International right here in Pittsburgh, Kansas. I believe God will use this sermon to impact your life and bring His greatness out of you. Man, I hope you get something out of this that will change your life. God bless you. Your time is very important, so I'm going to get right to the message. Have a wonderful day. Lord, help him. We got to talking last Thursday night about David. If there's anybody in the Bible that you can ever read, uh, you know with that, just with a total understanding that he was called by God. Amen. Not only was he called by God, but he was qualified to do the things that he did. And even though there was a lot of mistakes in his life, there was, there was that place, amen, that uh, he always come to God and he always knew what God had called him to do. And I think what happens to a lot of us sometimes is when we get into church, look at your neighbor and say, hang on, is sometimes we get churched instead of having Christ in us. And sometimes we conform to an ideology of what's over the door, or what denomination we're from, or how we do things, or this is, this is where it is. We got to have roots, and thank God for my roots. But I'm going to tell you something. In, in, in the last 20 years, I had to turn loose of a lot of things that I was taught in church. And it was tough to do at times, but I realized just because somebody said something doesn't mean it's the truth. Because you got to see it this way. You have to understand that, uh, that the truth doesn't need a crutch. It stands all by itself. Us, on the other hand, hand we need crutches a lot of times. But when the truth stands up, it doesn't need to lean on nothing. It stands all by itself. And so, and so throughout the years, a lot of times there was just a lot of stuff that had been uh, taught down through the years that, uh, that they meant well, but they took scriptures and they put different words in it. And they made it fit them. They made it fit where they was. I remember one time when I came to church, uh, after I had got out in the world and... and uh, uh, thank God for a praying mama that, that uh, got me prayed back in. Uh, and I know that I was called by God in the womb. But at the same time, sometimes it takes some prayer and intercessory for us to begin to move. But I remember when I come to my dad and I told him, it was in 1996, and I said, Dad, I think I'm called to preach. But I didn't say it that calm. I was like, shaking all over and I was I was upset and I was afraid because I knew that the church that we attended wouldn't accept somebody that looked like me preaching the gospel and I wasn't really ready listen I wasn't ready to be one of those preachers that had to look the part now, I'm not saying that you ought to be trashy or nothing like that, but what I'm saying is when I growed up, there was a certain way that a preacher had to look, and a preacher didn't have a mullet. And I liked my mullet. I mean, it was still in the 90s. I mean, I, I see these dudes walk around with mullets now, and I'm thinking, dear God, if they could just, in 20 years, they're going to look back and say, what was I thinking? I told my wife the other day I was going to grow a mullet. She said, no, I wasn't. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn me because we're going to talk about a story in here tonight. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 18. I got one scripture to read. Can I read one scripture? Is that all right? When you get 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse number 9, I'm going to read out of the NIV. When you get that, just stand to your feet if you would. David had a lot of flaws. He was no doubt called by God. 
One of the things that David put on his resume was one of the things that he was teased about. See, we have to understand and learn this, that the things sometimes that the enemy throws against us is really the greatest characteristics that we got. When it comes to defeating Goliath, David told Saul, he said, hey, I killed a bear and a lion. But the same story about the bear and the lion, his brothers made fun of him. Oh, you're just no shepherd boy. You think you're something because you killed a bear and a lion. Well, why don't you try it? So the same thing that they was pushing against him was the same thing that he used as a stepping stone. And what I want to say in here tonight is some of you, there are some things that the enemy is throwing heavy on your heart and he's trying to get you sidetracked, but those are the things that you got to use. I'm talking to somebody in here now. There's a calling on your life that is more real than anything. And the thing that you're struggling with right now is you. Look at your neighbor. Just point your finger right. You can do it in church. I'll give you permission. Point your finger at your neighbor and say, you're the problem. <laughs> Chad, you said that a little too loud. Did you say it? <laughs> ZZ Top ain't crazy. Second Samuel chapter 18 verse number 9. NIV. Y'all ready? Now Absalom happened to meet David's men. He was riding his mule. And as the mule went under the thick branches of a large oak, Absalom's hair got caught in the tree. He was left hanging in midair. While the mule he was riding kept on going. <laughs> Father, let me preach this like you give it to me today. God began to move in this place and touch lives. Father, stir us up in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Let me sit down. Isn't it funny how sometimes we get on those things, get on the course, and we think that we're right? Absalom, Absalom was one of David's sons. He had another son named Amnon, and he had a daughter named Tamar. Now, this story takes place in 2 Samuel chapter 13. And it goes all the way through 18 chapters. It takes six chapters. Is that six? Five? <laughs> I'm, from, I'm from Tuscan. It takes five chapters to get this story out. Most of the time when you start reading in the Bible, there's one or two chapters here and there. It ta I, mean, I mean, this is days of our lives. General hospital stuff, y'all. I mean, this is... This is the biggest soapbox story you will ever read. And you're reading it and you're thinking, man, these people are nuts. They're crazy. And sometimes we, 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 we look around and, and it, it's, 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 have you noticed? Everybody say, I love the preacher. Have you noticed that when you invite, invite somebody over to your house, you always give them the best of you? I mean the best of you. They haven't seen the worst of you because they may not be able to handle it. <laughs> so the real you, the real you, when you invite them over, that's not the real you. That is, that is, that, that is, that is selfie stuff. <laughs> and what happens is, is a lot of church people, y'all's gonna say this a lot, so just get ready to say, I love the preacher. Has come to the place in their lives that when they come to church, that's the face that they put on. And even though the church is a place of healing, it's a place of refuge, whoever thought that when you got saved the first time, everything was all right and you didn't have any flaws. Those are the people who are really crazy. Now, I'm not saying that every one of y'all has got flaws and you're just going to split hell wide open. That's not what I'm saying. 
But what I'm saying is, is there's some issues and there's some stuff in a lot. And the stuff that we're struggling with, that we're trying to hide the most, is the very thing that God's using in our character to build us up to become the greatest. And there is, and and yes, there are some flaws, and there are some issues, and there are some. I, I, I mean, if, if there's ever an identity crisis in the church today, it is the day that we're living in because most people have this a uh, 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 fake presentation about themselves. If you listen to people sometimes, and they say they say so so, will you pray? It's like, dear heavenly Father. <laughs> One time I was going to try to do that, and uh, I just got saved, hadn't been saved very long, and, and we had this little priest deal, and, and uh, back in the day, my dad used to have all of us, because there's about seven or eight preachers of us that, that kind of growed up in church, me and Larry Joe and all of us, we was just starting out to preach, I still preach better than him, but anyway, uh, we, 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 we was all just, just there, and it, 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 was, it was Larry on, on bass, it was me on drums, and it was, it was Sister Becky singing, it was Ann on piano, I mean, we had a band, I'm telling you right now, we had a band like, I mean, a crazy, matter of fact, matter Matter of fact, we'd get so crazy, we'd run laps around the church. Y'all don't hardly see that no more. One time, we got all the preachers together, and we went to the truck stop, the Toka truck stop, because it's the only thing that was open late enough for us Pentecostals, because it was like 11, 11, 30 time we got out of church. And so we went there, and so, so anyway, they said, uh, they said, Brother Roger, we want you to ask the blessing. And I mean, that, that's a high honor when you're among all the preachers. So I laid my fork down. Took me a drink of water, cleared my throat. I was trying to figure out how to start this. So I didn't know if I was going to say, Dear Heavenly Father or Dear Lord. So I said, Dear Heavenly Ford. (laughs) I was never so embarrassed in all of my life. I mean, I'm sitting there, and I, all them preachers, I mean, they start laughing, and so now that, that's, that, that's the big joke still to, today. But in my mind, I've got this, this, this thing that I've got to present. And I think what happens to a lot of us sometimes is there's a lot of stuff going on on the inside of us that by the time we get to the church, we're trying to be so spiritual that we don't get the help we need. This is a refuge place. This is not the place to come in and give our lives to God and we never have any problems. I, I mean, I mean, I mean, let's just be real. This is a place we are always going to need God. There's always going to be some level of us. There's always going to be some things in our life. There's always going to be some places we got to have God. This morning I went to Casey's and uh, get, getting fuel, and, and so I'm standing in, in, in line and I, I've got my coffee because it's a brand new Casey's out there. Man, I can't wait to try out the new coffee machine. So, so I'm there, and, 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 and matter of fact, I'm going to be a good husband and get my wife a hazelnut coffee and all this stuff while she's already at work. So, so I'm getting that, and, and I, I come walking around the corner, and there was a guy, and he said, Hello, Mr. Brown. I'd never seen the guy before in my life, and I said, Hello. And then I heard his little boy say, Daddy, do you know him? And he said, yeah, I work with his two sons. So evidently he was a firefighter. So, so I'm sitting over there and why I'm sitting, I'm standing over here and he's there and he steps up and this guy walks out. Now I'm not judging, okay? But he had on these pajamas that had skulls all over them. He had long hair and a beard. He looked like Polly Lawson. And I thought, is that Polly's twin? <laughs> and this guy tries to get up in front of him, and he steps up and he looks at this guy and he says, I'm next. And I says, okay. So he goes up and he prepays for gas. <laughs> he says, I want $30 on, on a whatever pump. Go out there. And so by the time this other guy goes and I go, he comes back in. He said, you didn't turn the pump on. So he goes back out across there. So this woman, she must have been new, so she's going over trying to figure out. There's nobody else there. Long story short, she's ringing me up, and and she finally gets me rung up. Before I get out, he comes back to the door again, and he goes, Really, ma'am? Turn the pump on. 
he goes out to the deal. So I come out and I get my coffee, and, I, and I'm walking out, and, and I just kind of look at him. And he says, keep looking at me and see what happens next. <laughs> now, hang on. I'm a short guy. But I just got 10 foot tall. Seriously. My blood was pumping. I looked over at the other pickup where the guy said, hello, Mr. Brown. And he looks at me and kind of raises his eyebrows. I think, uh, he knows I'm a preacher. So I go put my coffee in, in my truck. So I'm taking out more coffee cups that's in there. So I come out, and I, and I, I didn't want to look at him because I knew he was already mad, and I was mad, but I just couldn't help it. So I looked at him again. And he comes walking right across the parking lot and he's shaking his head like a turkey or a chicken. He comes up there and he, he hollers at the woman again and he comes back out and literally he starts going, ah! I, th I think, man, this dude is nuts. And all I can get over, it, all I can think in my mind is he's saying, keep looking at me and see what happens. So I kept looking. <laughs> I drove by, listen, listen, Lord, I done ask for forgiveness. I drove by him and rolled my window down and put my hand out on the truck. Because I'm driving Lane's diesel truck, so I'm a man now. Put my hand out on the truck, and I just look at him. And this dude hauls off and hits the back of his car. Boom! And so I just looked at him some more, and he goes, So I'm thinking at this point, okay, <laughs> is I'm going to get out and fight a crazy guy? <laughs> or I'm going to remember who I am. See, when I got saved, I didn't forget how to roll a joint. I didn't forget how to cuss. Probably just lost half of you. See, when I got saved, I didn't forget those things. I walked away from those things. And we have real issues. David's family has got problems. First of all, David sleeps with Beersheba. He hasn't, man, I know some of y'all thinking, man, I come to the wrong church. This is crazy. The angel of the Lord tells him, said, said, you will never be away from the sword. And here's what I'm telling you here tonight is there are some things in your life, yes, that God's going to move you past forward, but listen, there are some things you do not want to pay the price for. There are some things when God says, I've changed you, be changed. Walk away from it. There are some things you do not want to keep walking and paying the price for. So now, he comes and David, David's got kids. He's got a daughter named Tamar. He's got Absalom. And he's got Amnon. And the Bible says that Amnon decides that he wants to sleep with his sister. So he comes up with this story, this concoction in his mind. Hey, I'm going to sleep with my sister. And, 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 so, and, and so the story goes that he rapes her. Absalom gets mad. Two years goes by, he kills his brother Amnon. Y'all have to read this because I ain't making this up. So in the house, there's a lot of confusion, there's a lot of chaos going on. And what happens is, is in the church of God, what happens, people come and they sit in the church and they don't completely get healed. Let me tell you something. If your mind doesn't get free from the things outside in the world, it will eat you up. It will drive you crazy. You, you can come in. You can dress the part. You can shout the loudest. You can sing the loudest. You can be the best Pentecostal that there is. But if there are some things that doesn't leave your heart or get out of your life, they will haunt you until the place, until, until they start living in your life.
The Bible says that Aslam goes on this spree and he's trying to take the kingdom away from David. And so seven years had passed and now there comes a war between the families. Now Absalom is running from David's men. David's men says, do not harm my son. They're run, he, he, he's running from David's men. Absalom is this kind of guy that he's got curly brown hair and I mean, I mean, I mean, uh, he, 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 was, he, he was one of those dudes that was good looking. And he took pride and on his mule, he's running from the men chasing him. And the Bible says he runs underneath an oak tree and his hair gets caught in the branches and leaves him suspended. And that old mule that he was riding on kept on going. What I'm trying to tell you is there are things sometimes in your life if we do not get them fixed, and I'll say this right now because there are things that you're dealing with. If you don't deal with them now, they're going to deal with you later. And so, and so we better start dealing with some of this stuff now. Now we're seeing all kinds of crazy things go on. And now we're seeing the church take a split. And now the church, everybody say, I love the preacher. Now the church is split in the middle. Do we allow homosexuals or do we not? And now there's a big feud inside the church of what the Bible says and where it says it. I don't care if you're Democrat or Republican. I'm going to stand what God says. And I'm going to stand on the word. And the word will forevermore be true. And if God said it, I'm going to say it. If God stands on it, I'm going to stand on it. It might be 2021, honey. But I'm not changing my views when it comes to God. It if we don't deal with it, it's going to deal with us. And we got a lot of flaky Christians. Don't look at your neighbor right now. And it's not time for the church to come up with these hate groups or these hate ideals or, or, or who can't come to church or, or who can't come to church. That door is opened up to anybody. I don't care how long you've been in the penitentiary. I don't care what's on your record. I don't care what happened in high school. I don't care what divorce you went through. I don't care if your wife or your ex-wife's got your kids and you got one kid. I'm not looking. Listen, it's not for me to judge where anybody's been because I've been in some places but I can tell you now that my God can restore. My God can heal. My God can take the wounds of a person and make them right again. And we got to quit riding that old mule. And the church. Whew. I'm talking about all the churches. All them down the street, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm just joking. We've come up with these ideas on how to impress God. And we come up with these things on, on how we ought to approach God. And what we got to do. Here's one of the things that was brought up in church at the church that I grew up in. Are y'all ready for this? Well, I'm going to tell you right now, son. If you don't get it down to the blood, God ain't going to use you. And there's a lot of stuff that's got to be under the blood. But when I got saved, I didn't put it all under the blood. But the blood covered all my sin. So now you got half the people sitting over here trying to figure out, can I ever be used? Then you got the other half over here looking down their nose and saying, you know what? I'm the only one good enough to be used. And before you know it, you got the church trying in the confusion. God wants us all to begin to move. The Bible said we all have gifts according to us. Each one of us has got gifts according to us. Come on, somebody. God gave us gifts. God good put gifts in, inside of our lives. And God chooses to use. God chooses to save. 
the, 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 the Apostle Paul says it like this. Uh, I consider myself uh, the chiefest uh, among sinners, uh, but still yet uh, he's used by God. Uh, we have to understand uh, that we got to come to him and put those things out of the way because there's a hurting world uh, that is looking at the church, uh, and the church don't have all the answers, uh, but we need to take them to somebody who has all the answers, uh, and we need to lead them to Jesus uh, without any hypocrisy, uh, without any, I don't have anything wrong, uh, but lead them to Jesus. There's a world full of people sitting in church that's been in church all their life that hasn't got any further. Somebody says, well, you just got to move, preacher. You just got, preacher, if you don't move, God ain't going to move. Preacher, if you don't move, God ain't going to move. And see, we got this conception that we can move God when we begin to move. And I understand that we can pray certain things and, and God begins to move, but we're not powerful enough uh, to just move God. We got to follow him. He's not following us. The Bible says that in the desert, the Bible said there was a cloud over the children of Israel. And the Bible said uh, that the children of Israel, and some people says it like this, uh, well, them crazy people wandered around in the desert for 40 years. Uh, yeah, they wandered around the desert because they didn't move until the cloud moved. And when the cloud moved, they moved. The cloud was God. He was a pillar of fire by, 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 by night, uh, and he was a shade uh, in, in, in a hot summertime. Uh, and, and God would rain down manna. And so every time that cloud would move, uh, they would move. Amen. And the reason why they stayed in the desert for 40 years is because God was raising up a, a generation uh, in the middle uh, of a desert. And can I tell you right now, I don't know how. I don't know if there's any preachers left uh, still yet uh, that's ever uh, pastored uh, through a pandemic. Uh, but here we are uh, in the middle of a pandemic, uh, and here we are in a wilderness, uh, and here we are wanting God. Uh, but still yet at the same time, uh, we got self-righteous attitudes. Uh, my God, I'm on it tonight. Uh, we got self-righteous attitudes, uh, and we got people not getting close to God uh, because the church uh, has put up this fake picture on Facebook, uh, and they have done marked it all up uh, to look how good they look uh, and at the same time uh, they're not being real. Some of y'all don't know if you need to amen me or not. Some of y'all thinking, my God, I got more problems you can shake a stick at. If I say amen too loud, they'll think, yeah, that's me. We're riding a mule. And we're fighting a battle, fighting a war that we never chose, should have chosen to fight. So we're in the middle of a fight, riding our mule. And what's going to happen is we're going to get caught. And that hatred that we're riding on that jealousy that we're riding on? Oh, preacher, we ain't got jealousy. <laughs> okay, let me move past that one. All the bickering and the biting. All the my church is better than the other church. Come on, somebody. And so now the church that has the one that has the solution is divided in so many different categories uh, in so many different ways uh, and it's like we're trying to compete uh, about where we're standing uh, in the presence uh, and I need to tell somebody whether you're Baptist, whether you're Methodist or whether you're Presbyterian uh, if you've been bought with the same blood uh, I've been bought with uh, then my God is your God uh, and we need to stand up uh, hand in hand, uh, brother with brother, sister with sister uh, black with white, uh, Hispanic we need to stand and come across the tracks and be one. Yeah. 
got to separate it all out. Well, we got the Hispanic church here, and we got the white church here, and we got the crazy Indian church on Broadway, uh, Pastor. And, 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 and then we got this church, and we got this church, and, and, and uh, well, this people can get this people. And before you know it, 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 it has become, it has become a commercialized idea. When God called the children of Israel to come in to Jerusalem for the sacrifices, he called them to come in and he said, bring your sacrifice with you. Somebody come up with the bright idea. Look at your neighbor and say, somebody. Hey, let's raise the lambs in Jerusalem. Then the church can come and buy them from us. And we'll make money. And they can have church. So people would come all over every year for the Day of Atonement. They just come, just, uh, well, when I get there, I'll just buy me a lamb. I'll just purchase one. There'll be, there'll be a pretty one there, y'all. I'll get one. I'll get one. I'll get one. Yeah, I'll get one. Seems like we get ready for Thursday night church. Yeah, I'll get there. You know, I'll just, hey, when I get there, I'll just go to the altar and I'll tell God, here I am. Yeah, I will. I will. It'll be all right, you know. And before you know it, it becomes so commercialized that the church now is not standing in a position to help the hurting people. Now we're standing in a position that if I can make money here and I can make money here, let me tell you something. When I come to Pittsburgh, I didn't have two nickels to rub to my name. Now I got two quarters, praise God. I stepped up. I didn't have two nickels. Every dime that begins to move toward God, is about God and for God. And I've been fighting this old fight in Pittsburgh. He's a money preacher. He's a money preacher. And at the same time, I want to say something. But at the other time, God says, shut up. Because when the enemy's running his mouth, I'm blessing and I'm building and I'm bringing up and I'm restoring. And so what we got to do is do not worry about the person who says, you keep looking at me like that. We ain't got to worry about that. We got to do what God has called us to do and stand in a position and know what our calling is. People in Pittsburgh don't know if we're a charismatic church. They don't know if we're a backer church. They don't know if we're just a crazy church. They got all of these names all over. If you ask people, they get all, oh yeah, that's that, that's that backer church down there, London Bible. Now, that's this church. And that's, listen, listen to me. Listen, listen. I just belong to Jesus. Yeah. I refuse to ride the mule. I refuse to stand and fight a fight that Jesus has already won. And if there's family issues going on in your life, let me tell you something. Oh, this is, this, this is when I sit right down in your lap right here. Because when there's family issues going on in your life, that old mule with pride, get off of him before it's too late. It ain't worth it. I don't care what they said. Let me come down here. I don't care how long it's been going on. I don't care what they did behind your back. I don't care what they thought you did when you didn't do it. What lies been told, if there's family issues and family problems going on, that's where the enemy is coming first. Because if he can get your mind destroyed before you ever, man, I'm just all over the place tonight. If he can get your mind destroyed before you ever get here, then by the time you get here, then all you'll be is fake and phony, and you'll have the Pharisee's attitude in your life. And the message Bible calls it the Pharisee phonies. And we don't want to be pharisaical, and we don't want to be phony. We want to be real, and we want to turn it over to God, and we want to get off the mule. Let me sit down here. If we're having relationship issues, 
get off the mule. If you're in a church and you think that nobody it likes you, get off the mule. If you're in a church and you got a gift, and well, nobody's using me and I can sing, and get off the mule. Well, I can teach. Get off the mule. Come on, somebody. And the enemy uses that. We stay broke down. We stay hurt. We stay disgusted. But still yet, if I can make it to church, people will think, I'm okay. And as long as I can fool the people, as long as everybody thinks, and before you know it, our life gets caught up in the drama. Look at your neighbor and say, Drama. Chad, come on the guitar, would you please? That old mule that Absalom was on is not something that he just decided to get on. It was something that had been conjured up for years. It had been something that he had dwelled on for two years. And after two years, went another five years. See, you hear these stories about how people, when they get to that place, here's the thing. When you get to the place where you turn 30 years old, there's a milestone there. Then you hit 40, there's a milestone. When you hit 50 like Billy Ferris, there's a milestone. I know it. I'll tell you how it is. <laughs> And what the enemy likes to do is he likes to play possum. So all that hurt that you grew up with in your house, all of a sudden, he comes out and he starts bringing it up. Listen, I was 40 years old when I thought I was going to have a nervous, just moved to Baxter Springs, Kansas. I thought I was going to have a little nervous breakdown. I'd already been preaching for 14 years or 15. But I was dealing with some stuff that in my youth or in my childhood or growing up that it hit me like a ton of bricks. I didn't want to get out of bed. I'm dealing with some stuff right now. I still put on my clothes. I still uh, preach. Thank God I preach with clothes on, but I, 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 I still got behind, behind the pulpit and on the stage, and I still preach. I still laid hands on people, and, 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 and people was, was, was gloriously healed and filled with the Holy Ghost and things moving. And I would go home, and I was struggling. In my mind, a battle in my mind of stuff that took place when I was a kid. And I'm thinking, why is this happening now? Sometimes we see people in the church. Can, can, can I just help you all for a minute? Sometimes we see people in the church and they've been in church for 20 years. And all of a sudden, they're in the bars. And all the church can do is point their finger at them and say, well, they know better than that. Well, they should be right here in the church with me. Yeah, with your broke down self. This is where they ought to be, right here. It's because uh, all of a sudden uh, there was something that they was battling with uh, that the church uh, didn't have uh, the guts uh, to approach uh, or, to, or to preach about uh, or talk about. Uh, let me tell you something. Uh, I am uh, I am one of those preachers. Uh, I will get in your face and tell you exactly what God said. Uh, I don't need to tell you what I think. Uh, I don't need to tell you what my religion thinks. Uh, I don't need to tell you what the church thinks. Uh, I'm going to tell you what God thinks. Uh, and God 
God says, I have seen you and I have made an expected end just for you. People coming in church, leaving church. Coming in church, the coming and the going. And people's like, oh yeah, they just probably haven't, and they're just going through one of those deals. They ever so often preach it. They just go, well, what's wrong? Well, I don't know. They just they just got a lot of problems. I want to be the most loving church in Pittsburgh, Kansas. I don't need to be the biggest. I just want to be the most loving. I want to be the most daring. I want the riffraffs. I want the outcasts. I want the misfits. I want them all. I don't want just somebody who I think. I want those who their life has been in shambles, but they give their life to Jesus, and Jesus has ultimately saved their life. I want them people who has learned how to get off the mule. Remember that night, brother, when I come down there to the bar and you've been bellied up for a day or two? I'm telling off on you. Yeah, I, I didn't think you'd really real remember that. <laughs> and God had filled you with the Holy Ghost. We'd already said who you was. And I got a phone call. Said your brother's at the bar. And it was like, one o'clock in the morning. So I get up and it says, You going to the bar? I said, Yes, I am. I walked in there and I bellied up right beside him. Bartender said, What do you want? I said, Give me a Dr. Pepper. And I don't even like Dr. Pepper. I don't even know why I said Dr. Pepper. And I looked at him in the eyeballs. And I said, you're going to figure it out. But if I had to chase you to every one of these places, you're not going to outrun me. I'm going to come and find you. Now I'm preaching the gospel all over. Filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you this because this is not something that I'm just saying while I'm here. I've lived it. I understand it. I will come and get you out of the crack house, out of the dope house, out of the whore house. Come on, somebody. I will come in any house I need to because I come from God's house. And if I know that God has got a calling on your life, I know that the Holy Ghost in me is like a hound dog. It will sniff you out until it finds you and restores you. And I will not give up. The reason why the church is struggling right now is because they're fighting a fight. Most of your problems, I'm just going to get Dr. Phil on you for a minute. Most of your problems is stuff that you haven't dealt with. I am sorry that somebody inappropriately touched you. I am sorry that nobody turned it in. My God. 
I am truly sorry that you had to go through that life, young man or young lady, without your father or without your mother. I am sorry that you was raised. In, in, in these, I, 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 can, I can sit here and say I'm sorry until I'm blue in the face. But I need to tell you right now, if the car wreck didn't kill you, if the drug overdose didn't kill you, if you didn't lose your mind in the divorce, then that means that the calling of God, if you can hear my voice, is strong on you and the calling I'll find you I'll chase you down I'll hunt you down because the calling is greater than anything in your life we got people in the church who's lived through some of those things I've just talked about And they're in church. And they think they're in a masquerade party. And every time they walk in the door, they put on their mask. And they don't get the help that they really need. Because the church can't help them. God didn't intend for welfare to feed the people. He intended for the church to do it. He did not intend for Salvation Army to clothe them. He told the church to do it. He didn't intend for them people who's been in the penitentiary to get out and go into some kind of program to try to restore their life. He told the church, he said, he said, he said, he said, visit them while they're in prison. God help us. Every head bow. I know I was blunt tonight. But I'm feeling a breakthrough that's coming like never before. I'm feeling the glory that's coming over the church like never before. I feel like that there are several of you in here, man, woman, young lady, young man, God is dealing with right now. You've been running from church because the issues in your life have now went public. I don't know who I'm talking to. Either somebody posted on Facebook or on Instagram. And you're trying to find some kind of healing. And the enemy has told you <coughs> that all church people are hypocrites. And I can tell you right now that everybody in this place has got a flaw somewhere or another. And I can tell you right now that you will usually find hypocrites in church. But don't let that stop you from getting your healing. God wants to heal your mind. Who am I talking to? God wants to heal your mind. He wants to restore your life. He wants to bring family back. He wants your, he wants your heart back. God wants all of you. He doesn't want that part of you when you have finally figured out how to fix it and nobody's looking at your issue. He wants the real you all over this place. On the count of three, 
whether you've been saved for two minutes or 20 years. Maybe you're standing in for somebody or maybe tonight is the night you truly get your healing. Maybe tonight is the night that you're not worried about who's looking at you. Maybe tonight is the night you can be the real you. I don't need you to confess any of your issues to me. But if you step out in faith tonight and on the count of three, you step in this line tonight, I can assure you by the Holy Ghost that is speaking to me right now, the healer is here. Listen, I say it boldly. I say it proudly. And I say it because I know the anointing that is on my life right now. On the count of three, if you step out by faith, The healer, God Rafa, is here now. One, two, three. All over this place, whoever you are. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of the sin. Jesus is called. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide.
Father, we thank you. Praise God. Hallelujah. Isn't he so good? Wow. Hallelujah. Father God, once again, we're just in awe of what you do in our lives. We thank you, Father God, that you are the most powerful God. You are the only true God. And we thank you, Father God, that you have set our feet on a path to you, and you won't let us be moved. And we thank you for that, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen.